legacy is ongoing, it keeps going. It's something that passes from one generation to the other. So, so the definition that comes from the, um, from the Oxford Dictionary is that a legacy, get this, <laughs> they define a legacy as a thing handed down by a predecessor. So kind of similar to what, to what one of you guys were thinking the same. But as we go through the session, really have that in the back of your head, what you think a legacy is and how that relates to engineering. So now before we get started, I'd like everyone to take a moment, whether you have a, a pen and paper or whether you just want to think about it in your head, but what do you think the most important legacies of Canadian engineering have been in the past 50 years and what the most important ones will be in the next 50 years? I'm going to give you one minute to do that. So, great. Thank you. Thank you for reflecting. And I want you to keep those reflections active in your head as we move into the, the panel discussion and, and hear from these, these very intelligent folks. Um, so to set your expectations for this session, I also just want to identify that, as you know, um, we're, running, we're running a little bit behind today. So this session was originally planned to be an hour and a half, and we're going to have to work within kind of between an hour and an hour and 15 minutes. So the two requests that I'm going to make is that um, our speakers um, try to keep their presentations between 7 and 10 minutes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of have a, a, a bit of an a index card here to keep them on track. And I'll also um, request that you guys have, have understanding in that. Um, I originally set the expectation that they would have 10 minutes to present. So, so it might be a little bit rushed, but I want to make sure we get into a good conversation. Um, the, the other request that I'll put out there for you guys is to think about um, the questions that you want to ask and know that not everybody is going to be able to ask those questions, but you can, you can do it after the session. So without further ado, um, I'm not going to introduce everybody now. I'll introduce them as they come up. But our first, um, our, our, our first person to, to discuss kind of comes from the industry perspective. And her name is Sandra Murray, and she's the um, president and CEO of Jordan Engineering. Um, it was launched out of her basement 11 years ago, and located in Beamsville, Ontario, Jordan Engineering is made up of a team of engineers and compute professionals who design electrical control panels and custom-tailored industrial software. But I think through my discussions and what I've really learned from Sandra is that it's much more than that, in that a third of their revenue every year is invested back into the community. So I'm not going to go any further, and I'll welcome Sandra up to um, begin her discussion of what she sees the legacies of Canadian engineering being. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thought um, when I was asked to speak on this, I thought I'm not an expert in legacy of Canadian engineering. I have sort of a small perspective. But I thought if I think about the past that I wanted to share some of my perspective of the past, it might be worthwhile to share my story about how I got into engineering. And then I could give you a little bit of where we are today and then how I envision the future. So when I was in high school, very strong in math, really enjoyed science, uh, competitive swimmer, what to do with a career, go to the guidance counselor, um, they saw me rent or borrow a, a record <laughs> of Swan Lake at one point. Well, maybe you could go into music, and I'm not musically inclined, can't carry a tune, never played an instrument. Um, Went through a few other people, like what should I do when I finished grade 12. Uh, not really any strong answers. So I went on to grade 13, which at that time we had grade 13, and you went to a separate school. Uh, in grade 13, I took three maths, three sciences. So I took advanced chemistry, I took advanced calculus, and the other two maths and the other two sciences. Pretty close to the top of my class in both of the advanced courses. Um, most of the class was male. Um, got along great with everybody, really enjoyed the courses. Uh, again, sat down with guidance counselor, time to apply to university, and you were good at math, obviously. So I was always very entrepreneurial. Maybe you could go to university and write a math textbook. Okay, so I'm 17. <laughs> I'm really sorry to the academics, <laughs> but that was like a kiss of death for me. Um, so competitive swimmer went to my swim coach, who was coaching at Mac at that time, and said, yeah, you know, I talked to my parents. The response I got from my parents was that, um, yeah, how come you want to go to university? You know, you're just going to marry have kids, it's going to be a waste of money, maybe you should rethink it a little bit. Not an academic background. I, did, I had never in my life met an engineer. I had no idea what an engineer did. Did not realize that most of the males that I was hanging around with at school, that I really enjoyed their company, that I really liked the same courses they were doing. I mean, this is 25, 30 years ago. Uh, no idea that they were applying to engineering um, or what it was. So talk to a swim coach. Well, you could take phys ed. And I'll get you a swimming scholarship, so you could go to university. And I hated phys ed. 
<laughs> like, I took grade 9 to 7 and then stopped. It wasn't that I wasn't athletic. No, I ball, hand, coordinate, none of that, right? Can't play baseball, can't do any of that stuff. So, dropped out of school. Uh, right after our university exams, or sorry, university applications went in, dropped out, uh, again, the entrepreneurial leg kicked in, sold real estate for a short period of time, started a wholesale florist business, uh, tried a few different things. Six years later, quite a few of the people that I'd gone to grade 13 with were finished university, had their engineering degree, working in really cool jobs, <laughs> and got to talk to them about what they were doing. Uh, quite a few people that I had swam with, again, must attract a lot of that engineering type, went back to swim masters. They were in engineering, or they were in, um, or teaching even at Mac by that point. And I thought, wow, I really missed the mark here. Went back to school, uh, applied. So now we're, now we're in 1989, which is a while ago, but not that long ago. Um, and uh, went back to school as a mature student to a high school program, day school. Uh, ended up with the guidance counselor again and said, look, this time I know what I want to do. I want to do engineering. Here's my university application. And well, what do you want to apply to? And I said, well, I want to go to Waterloo for engineering. Well, you're setting your sights pretty high, aren't you? <laughs> okay. I said, you know, I really have no choice. I didn't know. At that point, I did not know that Waterloo was a tough school to get into. I knew it had a co-op program. And at that point, I was a mature student. I had a mortgage payment to make. I was going to have to go back to school. I had enough money to get through 12 weeks of classes, three weeks of exams, and then hopefully a work term that I could save up for the next class. So it was kind of a funny journey to get into engineering. I would like to think that anyone that is in high school today um, would have solid exposure to the engineering profession. Um, because it's a fantastic profession. So if I go to the present, today I, um, I started Jordan Engineering 11 years ago. Um, we have, we're a smaller company, we're a medium-sized system integration firm, but compared to some of the great companies that are here, <laughs> we're a smaller company. We have 18 staff, uh, we're in an old schoolhouse in Beamsville, so it's not a real contemporary location, but it's beautiful. I have a fantastic team working with me. Um, we do a lot of great work. We have my role shifted about three years ago and uh, really needing to make sure that I was doing a good job leading the company because sometimes that transition from technical to management to leading a smaller organization to a larger organization is tough. Went back to school, to the Ivy School of Business, and got my CMA, which is a certified management accountant, so I'd have the business background. Um, I can't be thankful enough that I started the foundation of my career with an engineering degree. And I would say, uh, some people will say if you, if you graduate from an engineering program, and then now you're, you're more into management, or you're more into business, or you've switched into politics, that you've left the profession. And I would say, no, I brought the profession with me. And I would really encourage, any time I get a chance to talk to young people that are trying to decide what to do, or a lot of our clients will have kids that are at that age trying to decide what to do, I say, the future for engineering is unbelievable. It, the potential is there. It is a respected profession. I mean, things that haven't changed from past, present, to future is that engineers are known for being humble, and they're known for being problem solvers. They're intelligent, they're hardworking, they're respected, and they're community first, duty to public and ethical. So if you think of those qualities, 30 years ago they were there, today they're there, and can you think of a single industry or endeavor or nonprofit organization, any project, can you think of any project that someone at the table with those qualities and spades would not be an asset to that project. I can speak up if you think of one. <laughs> um, so for me, coming to the engineering profession made a really strong foundation for me for my career, but then it also, if I look into the future, I would hope to see engineers more involved in politics and more involved in nonprofit organizations and more involved in boards and um, Everywhere. I sit on I sit on the board for the YMCA. I used to sit on the board for Women's Place, and I know uh, we bring something different to the table, and it is invaluable. But I also take back at least ten times what I've brought to the table. You know, there's a whole other exposure to a different industry that has helped me build my company. Now, our company. I think my biggest engineering feat. Some of you would say is not really engineering, um, but my biggest accomplishment was to engineer a corporate structure that I felt took the best assets from the corporate world and from the nonprofit world and combine them together. And that's for me, was an engineering job. 
because I really had to look at the full picture, dig down into the details and come up with an HR program that worked for people, come up with a profit sharing program, and come up with a link to the community. So I, I hope I've shared with you enough that you see how I see the future of engineering and also how far we've come. <laughs> Thank you. straight here. Thank you so much, Sandra. That was a wonderful sharing. Next up, I'm pleased to welcome Randy Pickle. Uh, Randy Pickle is the president-elect of the Canadian Society for Civil Engineers, and he's a senior project manager in the Toronto Infrastructure Group of Morrison Hirschfield Limited. I'll let, you, I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself, but I think it'll, he'll share a very interesting perspective from an industry association. Thank you, Josh, and uh, you know, let's just leave the introduction there. There's no use going into many more details as you load up, unless that's why I was stalling. <laughs> okay. So, Legacy of Keen Engineers, Past, Present, and Future, and I've subtitled this uh, From Delirium By to You, and we'll I'll explain that uh, as I go through. So Josh asked you the question, what's, what's a landmark, what's a legacy? Uh, certainly, there are prominent engineering works. You've got to ask your question whether they are landmarks or legacies. And, and I'm going to suggest to you that a landmark is a monument to legacy. The Roman viaducts have served, survived in you know, landmarks across the European frontiers, and they represent the legacy of the, of the Roman civilization that built them. They were examples of engineering works, that were designed and constructed with a life expectancy equal to that of civilization, which in Roman context meant forever. Another one to consider is the great cathedrals of the Roman Catholic Church. You think of them as architectural works, you've got to think of them as engineering works as well. It took a lot of engineering to put that building up. Uh, Notre Dame was constructed in 1163 to, 11, to 1345 uh, to replace a previous cathedral. And if you look, you've got one landmark that has survived for millennia, a cathedral that's almost 850 years old. And that's something to think about in, in this day and age. In Canada, we, we have a number of landmarks that define legacies as well. The construction of the Rio Canal was proposed after the War of 1812 due to the continued threat of American invasion. Construction started in 1826 under the supervision of Colonel John By of the Royal Military Engineers. The works were completed in 1832, and in 2007, the Rio was named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Citadel of Quebec City, conceived by a French military engineer, <coughs> Gaspard de Lyry, in 1716, although it was later constructed by the British under Colonel John By in the early 1800s. And both sites today, if you travel the country, you know they're major tourist attractions. So as I've noted, there are two influences in the world, in the new world in the 18th and 19th century. The French military, the British military. Of note, in the French military was Gaspard Delirie, as I just mentioned, born in Toulon, France, in 1682, introduced to military engineering by his father, who was also a military engineer, joined the French army to learn the art of fortification. He became the King's Engineer in New France in 1716 with no, form, no formal education, only what he had learned under his father. He prepared outstanding relief maps of Quebec City and Montreal, which are still in use in the archives in those cities today. He dedicated himself to fortifying the towns of the colony and primarily Quebec City and Montreal, where he built the walls around the city, and around, as I said, 1716, he developed the plans for the Quebec Citadel. He was a man ahead of his time. He saw the need to adapt, recognizing that the social, economic, and climatic conditions in New France would not be served by the building techniques and styles of France. He used new materials, designed plans for ease of construction, used prototypes, set conventions and standards for the building trades. The British military becomes an influence in Canada after the Battle of the Plains of Abraham in 1775 until the middle of the 19th century. 
And of note to Canadians is Colonel John By. John By's study at the Royal Military Academy was commissioned in the Royal Artillery in 1799, but he soon transferred to the Royal Engineers. By 1802, By is posted to Canada to work, under, to work on fortifying Quebec City and to improve navigation on the St. Lawrence River. He returns to Europe to serve under the Duke of Wellington during the Napoleonic Wars, and at the end of the war he retires, or so he thinks. In 1826, he's recalled and sent back to Canada to supervise the construction of a canal which would serve as a backdoor to Kingston, which was the Royal Navy base in Upper Canada. The first thing he has to undertake, though, is to find a place to house his men to build this canal. So he creates the town of Bytown, which we all know today is, is the city of Ottawa and our national capital. So, building the country. So, from delirium by, we move on to the building of Canada. We have the, eight, the engineering works of the 18th and early 19th century, and as illustrated by the activities of delirium by, the engineering works are undertaken for military purposes to improve the defenses of what becomes Upper and Lower Canada. You're kidding. Gotta be, I gotta be paid, Okay. We can skip ahead. <laughs> so in the 19th century, we move into works that are, are used to grow and expand, uh, unite the country. We have the Intercolonial Railroad that unites uh, the Maritimes in Quebec with a shipping route. The Machine Canal, which improves shipping on the St. Lawrence River south of Montreal. The Victoria Bridge for crossing on the St. Lawrence across the uh, mouth at the St. Lawrence at the Montreal. Uh, the Canadian Pacific Railway unites Canada with British Columbia. And we finally have the, exp the expansion, the invention of universal time. Four main players in this are Hugh Nicol Baird, Walter Shanley, Thomas Kiefer, and, and Sir Sanford Fleming. They all, if you'll if I had a chance, I'd go through and you'll see that they've all got extensive canal experience, railroad experience, uh, and that was the order of the day. You would move from job to job to job, and it was quite easy to leave a legacy of all those works that exist out there today that they accomplished. So works of the present, I'm going to suggest to you the St. Lawrence Seaway, the system of locks and canals and channels constructed by the St. Lawrence Seaway Authority. Expo 67 introduces to North American engineers the concept of critical path management. The Confederation Bridge, a P3 project of the federal government, and the 407 Express Toll Road, a project P3 project again of the provincial government. And I think you'll see, if you, if you look and reflect on these projects as compared to the earlier projects I mentioned, these are projects that are corporate driven. They are not, there is no one particular man like a Shanley or a Kiefer associated with them, uh, but they become corporate, uh, corporate projects. So our future legacy? Well, our destiny is our, is our own control. Engineers, as technical experts, need to be more visible. We must be aware not just of tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. As CSCE, we will be designing, and we see that we will be designing and building infrastructure that is sustainable, meaning that it has a long life, is built in a way that requires less maintenance, when maintenance is needed, it is provided in a timely fashion and from a budget that has been established for these purposes. It uses a minimum of non-renewable resources and can be repurposed. CSC hopes to see these headlines in the not too distant future where we are able to define a, in the clean environment a definition of sustainable infrastructure. And we're also moving towards being able to identify and grade the infrastructure of our national uh, 
uh, of, of Canada's infrastructure. And, and hopefully not too distant future, we hope to see headlines such as this. Canadian being the first civil engineer to win a Nobel Prize. Excellent. Thanks so much, Randy. Um, you know I'm moving right along. I like to keep things going. So, um, Dr. Yuling Cheng is our, is our next speaker. And, and Dr. Cheng is the director of the Center for Global Engineering at uh, the University of Toronto. And I think she has, has some really interesting ideas around the academic um, area to, to share with us. So I'm going to get her, uh, her slides up and I'll let um, her finish the, the introduction. <coughs> I'm going to start by making Josh uh, nervous. <laughs> As a professor, I'm used to, talk, to talking in 50-minute chunks. <laughs> so I, I wasn't sure I could do it in 10 minutes. I'm even less sure that I could do this in seven. <laughs> but I like the way Josh started the session, which is very much in keeping with my academic perspective as well. And he said, define legacy. Define your terms. Define, define your, your variables. But also, as an academic, as a professor, I think I'm going to ask more questions than, than I'm going to answer. And if you have this ready, you go. So I've titled this talk as the Grand Challenge for Engineering Education. I'm a researcher as well, but to, to this audience, I talk about the education aspect of, of my job. Uh, can I just um, so, and I didn't quite answer the question that Josh asked me to speak to because I wasn't. Sh I don't think of engineering as a Canadian thing. Uh, engineering legacies, I think, is a is a global thing. And uh, one of the most uh, prestigious engineering bodies in the world is the National Academy of Engineering of the United States. And in 2008, they the panel that they they convened uh, came up with a list of the 20 engineering achievements that they thought were the greatest engineering achievements of the 20th century. And you look at that, and yes, this is the legacy of, of engineering. Uh, can you imagine our lives without electricity, or a car, or airplane, or water supplies, or maybe too, not too many people listen to the radios anymore. This is 2008, and if you were done today, you might have to include an iPhone and an iPad on there. <laughs> but. Uh, Look at, look at these things and imagine our lives without them. In that same, same year, uh, the National Academy of, of Engineering also identified, and this is again with, a, with one of the panels, a list of 14 things that they thought were the grand challenges facing the engineering profession in the years going forward. So th these might be the future legacies. And the grand challenge actually came, started in the mathematical field, where people, mathematicians, would define, would, would identify some really challenging mathematical problems as a way of getting mathematicians to focus on solving those, those problems, for, for Math's last theorem, for example. Uh, and the Gates Foundation also took this concept and identified grand challenges uh, uh, related to addressing poverty, hunger, global health issues. So the National Academy of Engineering was following in, in, in this tradition in, def, in defining these uh, grand challenges for engineering. And this is a long list, you don't need to look at all of them. But compare what's been achieved in the past, past what the National Academy of Engineering thought were the greatest past achievements, and what it thinks that grand challenges are going forward. And if you look at the list on the left, uh, airplane for example, the Wright brothers, worked on their airplane almost in isolation. They didn't have to talk to politicians, they didn't have to talk to financiers, organizational structure people, management people. They could work as themselves, as, as engineers. If you look at the list on the right, they're very different. My personal fa favorite as a professor is the first one, so advanced personalized learning. So what does that mean? So in, in classes now, I lecture to sometimes up to uh, one class I just finished, 212 people. And so there's very little personalized uh, attention there. But personalized, one form of personalized learning would be something like an expert computer system where a student can uh, 
answer questions. You can you can do do some reading, answer some questions. But depending on how you answer the questions, how you answer correctly, or how you answer wrongly, the expert system can figure out gaps in your fundamental knowledge, fundamental understanding, or maybe preconceived notions that are wrong, or some tendencies in the way you think, and give you the, the appropriate next set of instructions to help you learn in the best way possible for you. A phenomenal image, a phenomenal vision from my point of view, but what would be involved in doing that? In the, not, it's not just going to be algorithms and computer programming, and not just the disciplinary knowledge, but the engineers need to be working with education spe specialists, cognitive psychologists, in order to be to turn that dream into a reality. And I can point to every single one of these examples. And engineers would no, no longer would be working by themselves. They need to be working with psychologists, politicians, policy people, social scientists, and so forth, in order to, 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 to turn these challenges in, into reality. And that's my, my very simple message. Right now, uh, my, my home department is chemical engineering. I'm the director of our Center for Global Engineering, but I do wear a different hat. And from the chemical engineering point of view, we teach math, physics, chemistry, it's a very long list of courses. Civil engineers would have a different list from our overlapping. Electrical and computer engineers would have yet a different list. But how do we teach everything on the left and still get them to get students to understand things on the right? And how do we do it in an integrated way? Uh, so ethics isn't set off to the side. Oh, that's ethics. That's not what engineers do. Oh, that's communication. So, oh, that's leadership. That's not what engineers do. Okay. And I was, as I was thinking about this talk, I was reminded, actually, of uh, past experience. Uh, I, this was about 1994, 1995. And I was involved in setting up the first biomedical engineering undergraduate program at the University of Toronto. And that would have been the first one in Canada. It went through those same arguments. How can we teach all the engineering that students need to know? And still, in, in biology as well, because they would need to know both in order to be good biomedical engineers. And that debate doesn't exist anymore. Okay. So that debate now, if biomedical engineers are as good in biology, the best biomedical engineers are as good in biology as they are in engineering. And why can't we have a kind of engineer that would know as much about society and social issues as they do about technical issues. And that, to me, is a great challenge for engineering education going forward. And I'll just leave you with a quote. Through the engineering accomplishments of the past, the world has become smaller, more inclusive, and more connected. And the challenges facing engineering today are not those of isolated locales, and I won't read all of it, but also, uh, meeting all those challenges must make the world not only a more technologically advanced and connected place, but also a more sustainable, safe, healthy, and joyous, in other words, a better place. And we want to prepare the engineers in order to cre create a world like that. To, to next up, welcome a, uh, a fellow Vancouverite who's come all the way from the from the West Coast to uh, to join us here. And his name is uh, David Helliwell. He's the uh, co-founder and CEO of Pulse Energy, um, which has a very interesting um, business model, which he, he might share a bit with you about, or you can look it up after. Um, but but David also has an interesting background in both the uh, the federal government of, of Canada in management consulting and also in geotechnical work. Please welcome David Helliwell. Hi all, I, I should declare up front that I'm not actually an engineer, uh, but I, some of my best friends are engineers. <laughs> actually, my, I married one, uh, my, my wife Nancy is a civil engineer who's built all sorts of wonderful things. Um, I've been friends with George Roeder since shortly after EWD started uh, the African connection of being the token white guy and uh, three different African bands from Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, Congo. 
Um, so, but I'm, I'm still, I, I was a geophysicist, so I was a member of APEG for a little while before I stopped being a geophysicist, but I'm uh, not. So I'm gonna talk to you more about a forward-looking uh, legacy for, for what, what engineers can be. And I'd encourage you to think of, imagine 20 years, 50 years from now, just a collective legacy of the people in this room, and imagine what, what that could be at home and abroad. And uh, I think it's, it's really, it's, it's amazing to think what each person here could, could do. So that's gonna sort of be the theme of my 6.5 minutes. Um, but I, I also wanna recognize a couple, of, I've got a couple of colleagues here, uh, Doris Tang in the back, who's uh, an engineer civil borders leader in, in Vancouver. Jamie McDonald, who's, just, who's more of an engineering tag along, but uh, he's, he's, he's a policy wonk like, like me, and uh, now he's with, with Pulse Energy. And uh, so, two things to, to think about, uh, and then I'll try to revolve the next 5.75 minutes around, will be, uh, one is a, a brick metaphor, that if I were gonna write a, a business book, it'd be about this way of thinking about your career, and you're really building on the last point of there are so many things you need to focus on to be a really good engineer, a productive member of society, how you put those together. Um, and then the second one is to really think about the impact that, that you can have and to be clear that it doesn't have to be within a nonprofit to do things that can, that can help the world. So briefly for the, um, for the brick metaphor, this is something I came up with, by the way, as I was looking for a job after I jumped around between being a professional windsurfing racer and an exploration geophysicist looking for oil and gas and looking for minerals and traveling all around the world and then trying to get a job as a management consultant and linking it all together. And also to get my mother off my back because she was seeing all my friends advancing quickly in careers and it seemed like every year I was starting from, starting from scratch. Um, but really what, what it is, is if you try really hard for a year and you learn a lot and you work hard, uh, you get a brick at the end. So maybe you're learning some engineering skills, maybe you're learning about public policy, maybe you're learning how to play guitar, maybe you're learning how to work in the bush, maybe you're learning how to communicate with people from different countries. These are all things that take a lot of effort. And if you work hard, you get something at the end of the, at the, end of the year. Now, the trick is, that you need to, if, if you put all your bricks on top of one another, to so say you do the exact same type of law every single year. After four years, you get a pretty good salary, your mom thinks you're getting somewhere. Uh, but you know, after eight years, ten years, you haven't done anything else, it gets a little wavy, as our civil engineering brothers and sisters could, could, could tell us. But if you have a foundation of things that are in a reasonably coherent area, and you don't need to over-design exactly where every brick goes, but they cover off a little bit of an area, um, yes, your mother will, for the first four or five years, when she can't see any bricks above the grass, give you a little bit of grief. Um, but once you start building on those and, and connecting things, it starts to be something really, really powerful. So I'd encourage, you know, particularly, um, so how many, engine, how many people are there under 30? Okay, and if you're not quite sure, okay, leave your hands up for a second. Now, and, and if you're not quite sure what you want to be doing in 10 years, leave your hand up. Okay, good. So anyway, the brick metaphor is kind of for you. And for the others, you should probably think about it anyways. Because um, it really does bring, you know, in terms of a, a career that's, that's going to be meaningful for you and really have, have an impact. There are a lot of different elements that need to, that, that need to come together. Second piece. Okay, so you're building yourself a structure, and this is something you can do along every step of your, of your career as you're building something really, really impressive, is wherever you are, just be doing stuff. Never wait for things to, to happen. So you can be in a big, mean, old corporation, and there's amazing, there are levers that you have wherever you are to really make things change. Or you can be with a company like Pulse Energy, this is my plug, um, we are recruiting. We have a number of engineers, blood borders people, and uh, we have a very good bilateral relationship with, with sharing people. We need basically anything that any of you might do. We probably are recruiting for something like that. But anyway, PulseEnergy.com. <laughs> but, uh, but, but so there can be companies like us where, by our nature, we save energy in buildings, and the more the better our business does, the better the world does. But there are others where it's a little more, you know, it's not as direct a connection. But there's so much that individual people and individual engineers can do to really make, make a big impact. So, you know, when I see, so again, my, my, I have an unusual window into the world of engineering, which is often around pillow talk with my wife, uh, and, and seeing how things are changing, and just, you know, the, the generational changes of, you know, how engineers work, what they do, who engineers are. Um, 
I, I should uh, that you didn't mention anything from BC for the uh, for the engineering marvels, um, but made me think of there's one just uh, that I took to the airport yesterday, the, the Canada Line from downtown to the airport. Wonderful woman Jane Bird ran the whole ran the whole project, and it's really uh, really an extraordinary thing for Vancouver. So. I'd like to get the questions and answers. Nobody ever gets angry if you finish a talk before time. So uh, just to to leave you with the idea that you know wherever you are and whatever it is, there's something you can do to make a big difference and to build another brick. Thank you. Great, thank you, David. Um, moving right along into our next uh, next speaker, uh, you guys heard her referenced uh, um, at lunch and. Has, has quite a big partnership with um, Engineers Without Borders, and I'm pleased to welcome Diane, uh, Diane Freeman, who's the president of the Professional Engineers of Ontario. Well, good afternoon, and just while Josh is loading up my presentation, I'm going to get started in conservation of time. So those of you who don't know me, I kind of have two jobs. I work as a consulting engineer, and I also work as a city councillor. But um, my most important job is that I work as a mother. And so I wanted to kind of spend a few minutes with you and tell you a bit about how it is that I've kind of combined these non-traditional careers of engineering and politics, where I, what, where I came from and where I'm headed. And um, so I just I wanted to start kind of at the beginning and say that um, I grew up in a household where my brothers and I were always mentored that kind of heart of volunteerism. And I learned through example from my family that, uh, that uh, experiences, these experiences played a really important role in, uh, in, in my choice in, in terms of post-secondary education because when we talked as a family about careers in engineering, we didn't talk about engineering being gender specific and we didn't talk about engineering being just technically math and science. We talked about engineering being a caring profession and a giving profession and a serving profession. And uh, one of the other events that I wanted to share with you related to when I received my iron ring. And just the whole notion in the iron ring that engineers are called to serve was very profound to me. And it, and, and it, really, it really makes me say that we need to, as engineers, take a step back from our day-to-day -day routine and consider the fact that our work has to serve a larger community. And I really truly believe that if we all do approach our work, whether it's engineering or volunteerism or parenting from that perspective, that we're giving back to a community in which we live and designing for people who need us and creating to make our world a better place, then a lot of people have a, a much greater ability to identify the importance and the relevancy of our engineering. And the last event, that I think was very significant in my decision to enter into politics related to something associated with m my, my being a mother of two small children. And, and I said this earlier today when I was together with some folks that I think we are going to make the, the strongest community as, or the strongest uh, difference as an individual when we're placed in a position where we're uncomfortable. And we're very uncomfortable and that is going to force us to think innovatively and to make change. And in my case, I was really uncomfortable with the state of childcare in the region of Waterloo. And it was out of that lack of comfort that I found a few other folks that felt the same. And back in 2000, we came together to build the Butterfly Learning Center. It's 10 years later. It now operates at two locations. It provides care to 148 children on a daily basis and employment to 30 staff. It's led the way to raising the bar of childcare in the region of Waterloo, and it was recently chosen the number one childcare center in Waterloo region. And it was really during the development of that childcare center that I very quickly came to realize that policymakers and government decisions have very, very profound effects on the ability of companies to do business, be it in a municipality or within the province of Ontario. That daycare was regulated by the Day Nursery Act, and we had to go through a whole process of getting all the planning approvals and everything right to build that daycare. That's when I met a mayor, and she said to me, Diane, when are you going to run? And so I really thought about that, and in 2006, 
a ward became available in Waterloo where there was no other councillor running. So on May 27th, I signed my nomination papers. On November 10th, I was elected. And on November 4th of 2006, I was officially sworn in as a councillor with the City of Waterloo. And why did I run? There was two reasons. Exactly what I said before, I believe engineers are called to serve and that serving as a politician is absolutely a calling. If you think you're getting into politics for the big check at the end of the day, the, the wake-up call is there's no check. The, you know, the, the other thing is, is that I really believe women bring value to decision making and that was said earlier, you know, that it sometimes, and, and so I just think gender diversity and, and, and diversity in general brings value to the decision making. And so that's what I put on the ballot was engineering and being a woman. I now am entering my second term as a councillor. It would appear as though the citizens of Waterloo twice felt that those things brought value to the table. And I wanted to share with you what I think are kind of the, the, four, the four things that engineers bring to a policy decision-making table. One of them is I think they bring an analytical mind. That ability to, to pursue a decision not based on emotion, but rather based on all of those technical facts. And that doesn't mean that you don't have to be passionate about the decision. It just means that you have to have the fundamental reasons behind you as to why it is that you made the decision, and then you can be passionate about it. And then the other thing I think that engineers bring is they, they bring this whole notion of working collaboratively and working on teams. And I think that collaborative decision making facilitates looking at a variety of decision options. And I also think that it helps to look at things like partners and delivery. And this can be particularly important when you're, in a, when you're making decisions in a highly constrained budget situation. And, and, and an example I brought with me was uh, the example of constructing a new recreation facility in the region of Waterloo, in the city in particular. And the only way we were going to get that constructed based on our fiscal financial constraints was that we needed partners. And so we partnered with the YMCA and they built the fitness facility and the swimming pool and we partnered with the University of Waterloo and they leased land to us and we serviced university land so they can grow and build. And the third person we partnered with was the library and we built a library. It's not open yet but it's going to be a great facility. It is. I also think that engineers have a willingness to set out the ground rules as givens. And basically what I'm saying is that the laws of physics can't be broken. So, so when you're sitting around a policy decision making table, I think it's fundamentally important that at the end of all things, you're going to end up with a decision that's implementable, that is within the mandate of what you're given, whether that be the planning act or the municipal act or whatever, and that it's actually going to bring value to someone. And, and so I, I think that as engineers, we're really good at that. We, we, we have a willingness to say, well, let someone else derive the formulation, but I'm going to use the formulation to create something, whether that's a bridge or whatever. And um, I have an example of a Planning Act application, and I can chat about that later. But the, the last thing I think engineers bring is I think that the language of technology is cross-cultural. And we heard that this morning. That gentleman from Kenya, he said, yeah, I got the blue screen of death. We all knew what he meant. Okay. You don't have to live in Kenya to know what the blue screen of death means. And, and so, you know, that's what the, I think that's true. Like, and, and, and I think that when we're technically minded, we enter into similar conversations which help us to work collaboratively and build to, to teams. And, and I specifically feel that in politics, people have on many of an occasion come up to me and said, are you so stupid? How could you support that? And, you know, to be able to sit down with them, and the example I showed here is a roundabout. We had to make a decision. Either it was going to be a roundabout or it was going to be a traffic light. And everyone said, are you so stupid? All you need is an all-way stop. And I said, you don't understand. I'm not a traffic engineer. The traffic engineer didn't say I could put an all-way stop there. They said I could put a traffic light or I could put a roundabout. Those are my two choices. The roundabout's 98% cheaper and it's 50000 a year less to operate and manage. So those were my choices and I picked the safer option. And the guy says, well... I don't think, I never thought counselors worked that hard, for one thing, that they read that stuff. 
And the second thing was, I still don't agree with your opinion, but I appreciate the fact that you have a reason how you came to it. Okay, and, and that's the givens as far as I'm concerned. And you know, the, the last thing I want to share with you is that being an engineer and a wife and a mother in public office, it's not without its challenges. And, you know, but I think that engineering helps you to be prepared for that. I've worked as a consultant my whole life, early mornings, late nights, meetings at all times of the day. So I felt like I was totally prepared to go into that public office and continue to do that consulting life that I'd always had. And I think it's really important as, as parents to mentor your children in volunteerism and mentor your children in public office. And so I love the fact that I can do that. And you know, my son, I said to my son one time, I said, you know, Scott, people really think that I choose to sacrifice time away from you and Adam and Dad to do all the things that I do. And my son said, Mom, that is not true. Right? Like, this is a kid who's 15 years old. He's met the Premier. He's met the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. He's met the mayors of all the cities. He's met the, the you know, the Attorney General of Ontario. He knows, he knows this person's first and last name. Right? My kids see value in that. Okay? Those are good things. Those are good outcomes. Those are our next generation. And you know what? Jane Jacobs said, that good public policy is developed when the policymakers can keep in their mind's eye the people affected. And I believe that engineers have the best skills and the best tools at their ready and at their resources to make Jane Jacobs' vision come true. Amazing. Thanks so much for sharing, Diane. And I think I'd like to request of all of you a, another warm round of applause for, for the amazing... <laughs> uh, so we've got about 20 minutes left for conversation, which is really exciting because I think we can all take our learning to the next level by asking some questions and, and hearing the responses from each of the speakers. So the, uh, the format that I'm, I'm, I'm going to suggest is to have um, people, in, people uh, the, the delegates, you guys, put your hand up. I'm going to take three questions at once um, and write them down, and then I'm going to pass it over to the panelists, and, and you guys can, can respond um, to maybe one of them, uh, a number of them, however you kind of kind of feel, and, and form a bit of a conversation. And I'd, I would also request that if you would like to um, ask a question of one of the other panelists, to definitely feel compelled to do that. So. Um, we'll start things off. Um, I'm just going to grab a flip chart marker, but um, And so I really pushed the company to think about working part-time. 
and, and not to be crude, but the exact comment I got was, I don't give a fuck what you think, I run the company, and I'm going to set the policy direction as I want. That was the words he said, and I said, well, that's cool. I don't think your policies are in keeping with where the world's headed, and I don't think it supports families, and I don't think it supports women's professionals, and you're going to write a contract that I'm going to have to sign, and it's going to be nasty to me. Thank you. But you know what? Five years, ten years later, there's a total shift in the company, right? That particular individual is not in the decision-making position anymore, and the company does not feel that way about it. But it did take someone to step up and say, and not give up on the company, and say, this company is worth investing in. I do not believe that one person speaks for all. And I'm going to stay the course. <laughs> I, I, and I guess, I mean, maybe I should ha have, a, have a word too. I, my, my first job was with Amico, just a little tiny oil company that's now part of BP. And uh, so that's where I started d d doing those sorts of things. And for sure, you're not going to change the core values of a company overnight. But if there are enough voices in enough places, one, saying something, and two, doing things, and you can rally other people. And it doesn't take much. Uh, you know, I was also, I worked at the corporate headquarters of a 60,000 person global consulting firm. Uh, during the dot-com uh, crash and was trying to convince the bosses of this huge company to use consultants who weren't being booked out to do pro bono work. Uh, to, it's good for everybody. Anyway, he said, no, because we might get this huge deal, but of course they never got. Um, but, you know, you keep pushing at it for long enough, you say, oh, wait, okay, look what would have happened if you would have done it. Everybody would have been happy to say, hmm, okay, maybe next time. And if you don't start, then you'll never get there. And that's my point, is, you know, every day, if you're not going to win every day, most days you lose on those things. But then if you know, enough people are pushing on it, then ultimately you get it. Great. Um, all right, uh, let's take two more questions, and then we'll, we'll put it back to you. And when you're thinking of the questions in your head, think about how you can connect um, multiple parts of what the different speakers um, share together. So, uh, okay. um, so as, as an engineering student, how do you, or like as, as you become a graduate in engineering,
foreign trained uh, engineers or whatever. Capacity is being built all around us. And, and so I think that we just have to continue to support that growth in all areas, whether that's foreign students, whether or not that's foreign trained engineers. We have graduate, we have licensed more foreign trained engineers at Professional Engineers in Ontario in the last five years than we have Canadian engineers. I think that's capacity building. I do. Okay. Should we answer both at once? Or? Yeah, either like both at once, either one, whatever you're whatever. Okay, so I'll, I guess I'll talk about the second question and what what are the three most important qualities. And there are actually many qualities, but uh, and I'm not sure these are the top three. <laughs> Uh, one I would have is very close to the top, if not at the very top, is the, the ability to keep learning. And we can't possibly teach you everything there is to know. And and if your knowledge is going to be limited by mine, and then the next professor who talk, who learned from me is going to limit the the learning of the next generation of students. Pretty soon we're going to be in deep doo doo. <laughs> And so hopefully you're going to be learning a lot more. You, I, my, my ambitions for my students is that they become smarter than me. And if every generation is smarter than the previous generation, then we're in good shape. Then we will be in good shape. So that, that's number one, the ability to, to keep learning. Um, and second point is maybe also related, is to be open-minded. Don't, pe don't peg yourself as an engineer and engineers only do this. Uh, listen to other ideas, learn whatever you, you think is important, whatever you think is interesting to learn. And it's actually very similar to what David was saying about building bricks. Learn. Everything you learn is, is a brick. You know? And, and the, at the end of wherever you are, what you're worth to a potential employer or a potential uh, community that you're trying to serve, your value is integral of your life's experiences up to that point. And whatever, the more effort you put into learning and, and building your own skills, the more useful you're going to be. And, I, and actually, aside from those two, the other things are, are much less important to me, so I'll just stop at two. <laughs> I've got a quick list. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that there's a foundation of actual engineering skills. That, 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 that's just a basic. Um, so first one is integrity. Uh, second one, mix, mixing two things that are sort of connected of passion and perseverance. That they're, you, need, you need both of those to get things to get things done. And then creativity, which obviously you don't want everywhere in engineering, like for what the rivets are going to look like to hold an airplane wing together. But there are a lot of things that need creative solutions and, and creative thinking. So those are the three most important qualities uh, in terms of the building. The uh, I was a Canadian expert in the brain drain in 1997. I wrote a couple of papers, and we actually stopped to you know, help, help to put together, put down the whole idea that there was a brain drain in Canada. It turns out we are net gainers of. Uh, of people from around the world, we get more um, masters and PhDs than we lose bachelors. It's, it's quite something. So, but for that, the, the big firms in Canada are a great place to train and learn, and then go and spin off and join something smaller and come to Pulse Energy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a number of years ago, the Gain Society for Civil Engineering. You got to understand, we we are a learned society. We are a society of, of technology and technical information transfer, so that's the, you know, the, the roots of the society. We're not a licensing body, licensing body like PEO is. Uh, we undertook a poll of employers across the country a number of years ago to see just what kind of skills they were looking for from students and graduates and, and new employees. And what we found was that there's a definite lack of the soft skills. That you know, we know, yes, as David says, we know you can promote, you can design a structure, you can design a column, a beam, a sewer, a road, but can you communicate with the client on, on a professional level and, prevent, and present those technical reports logically and, and professionally as well as, you know, presentations, uh, no low skills. And that is, seems to be what's lacking. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, CSE does offer some of those soft score, soft core 
uh, learning sessions to drag competing education programs. So, you know, that's Thank you, guys. All right, uh, two more questions. Is, are you guys finding it? I didn't really think it was useful to write it down, so I'm just going to get you guys to say it up. Um, first of all, thanks guys very much. It was great to listen to all of you and get a good perspectives. Um, I had a fascinating conversation with somebody I brought up today, uh, an engineer from Hatch, and we were discussing the relationship between um, engineer developed borders and the professional engineering society, and we have a lot of experience up there to speak to that. Um, and he was kind of challenging me on how we can uh, engage in the professional engineering society, um, given the challenges of professional engineers heading overseas and developing their placements, the way EWD works. Um, and he was, you know, trying to um, push me as to how EWD is going to engage the wealth, experience, and knowledge, and I didn't have a great answer for him. Um, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts. Um, Diane, given a recent uh, agreement between the EDO and Engineering Global Borders, uh, and the rest of you out there, how can EWB effectively engage um, professional engineers who have great experience, um, but aren't necessarily in the same position as uh, you know, some of us young engineers well, I think that I think there's a, a series of ways in which EWB has already engaged us. Um, I, I think that the partnership that we've started is really is is really at its early stages, in, and but very exciting. I, I mean, I must share a lot of George's excitement that he, he spoke at at lunch, and and I know Catherine does, I know Kim does too, and and the, there's a couple pieces. I mean, one is is that professional engineers on are starting to look at how do we account for some of that technical expertise that that um, individuals are gaining when they're doing engineering works outside the boundaries of Canada. So we're looking at how do we account for that that time, um, and we're also working with Engineers Without Borders to help them to see value in undertaking their work under the under the auspices of being a licensed professional. Because that has been missing too. That piece has been missing as well. And I'm really passionate about that piece because that gets right to the core of what I was trying to talk about in terms of the relevancy of the PM license. And the fact that we as professional engineers um, should be judged not only on whether or not the design is technically competent or sound, but whether or not we demonstrated a high level of professionalism in delivering on that, and that the work that we did brought value and relevancy to the lives of the people that we're trying to do work for. And I personally believe that much of the work EWB is doing does exactly that. It brings value and relevancy to the lives of the individuals where they're working. And I just in a perfect world, I'd love to see every person doing that work be a licensed engineer. So that that, that work is being acknowledged as being professional and relevant. And so I think those are ways in which we can work together. And you know, we've got a mentorship program, we have a student membership, student membership program, we have a mentorship program. If you're currently a student right now, our student membership program is free. Sign up for it. Join. If you're if you just graduated or you're graduating in May, the the engineering training program is free for the first year. Just register for it, and then there's mentorship opportunities within that. And PO is looking at other opportunities to strengthen and build on our member on our mentoring. Of, of new young professionals. And, and so I think that, like I say, we're at that early step of working together. And I'm excited about it. I feel like I've talked to a bit. From a corporate perspective, um, we've really had some really great opportunities presented to us because of our relationship with the WC. And I think it, it is a great retention program for employees because the work is more meaningful. Um, earlier this year I was fortunate enough to be able to go to Zambia and firsthand. I mean after a de almost a decade of supporting the WB, we could see some of the work. And through that um, there was two different organizations that we were introduced to and each of those had a spot where we could volunteer some time, volunteer some resources. Um, there were there was 
a wealth of opportunities for Jordan to get involved in the in-house project. Next time we went to bid on a job, the glasses would be doing global work. So actually, we're doing a project for Zambia right now. So I mean, it was it, it gave us an opportunity to grow as a company. It gave us a meaningful project work to give not that the other project work's not meaningful, but it has special meaning to some of the staff. Um, potential for them to go on site to transfer knowledge. And yeah, the, the partnership, it's really hard to find enough ways to give back to the company for all the benefits that we get from our partners. The Canadian site is certainly during the work with <coughs> PWB for a short term now, but uh, we are two executive directors have been in discussions. Uh, we are offering our resources to the uh, Recently, I believe there was a mentor, uh, a mentor uh, opening at uh, EWB that needed to be filled. Uh, CSC helped out by broadcasting it to our members, and I believe that, cross, that uh, position's been filled through, through our efforts in helping out at EWB. And, and we're looking, we had a roundtable discussion uh, earlier this morning on these guys talking about Certainly, uh, you know, CSC is looking to move ahead and, and be a resource uh, to EWB as well as uh, ensuring that our members are well aware of what EWB stands for and what to do and, and maybe provide opportunities for them as well. challenge of, of engineering education. <laughs> we, don't, we don't have all the solutions yet, but, but they're, they, we, we, we're talking about it. Uh, there was just a, a session this morning, some of the academics uh, in a closed door session this morning talking about just that. Um, uh, the solutions may, it will, well, it will most certainly involve looking at the curriculum more carefully and seeing if we actually need all the technical things that we have in there. Uh, or it might include something like having less technical things as core as being required, but then giving students more choices so those who, who wish to go in depth in, in the technical subjects can do so, but those who wish to have a broader uh, education can also do so. But, the challenge is going to be in retaining in, in what is the most important technical content that we need to retain. And my, my thinking on this, and so another part of that challenge is getting the faculty to buy in. There are these the people who are going to be teaching the courses. And, and, and believe it or not, uh, professors can, can do whatever they want in class, almost. And, and uh, so, so it's not easy to get professors to teach things that they don't agree with. And so, so the, the faculty culture is yet, yet a, a, a second challenge. Uh, I personally think that if we think about, it, what's important is having a framework, a technical framework, so you get a very good understanding of what it means to think scientifically. What is sound scientific logic? what is sound engineering logic, and having the, the vocabulary. And once you have the basic, it's like having grammar and, and, and vocabulary in English. And once you, you have that, and, and maybe showing you some poetry, okay, so you have an appreciation of what beautiful language means. So you can have an appreci appreciation of what beautiful engineering means. And once you have that, you can go and read more books. So you don't, we don't need to, to, to teach you Shakespeare and uh, you know, like Faulkner and Hemingway. We don't, we don't have to teach you everybody. Okay? But once you have some appreciation, appreciation and understand how, how people appreciate literature, or how people appreciate theater, you can go on and read more plays on your own. But that's what I think. But I'm not the only person there. <laughs> well, can I add to that? Like, I think, I know that the Cherokee 
Association Board is here uh, today. And um, and I think too, like I think that, that this, that's something that as a profession, I think is a value for us to talk about because all of the professions across Ontario work together with Engineers Canada to develop the Canadian Accredited Engineering Programs. And there's a, they have a lot of say in what the universities are doing and how that is translated across Canada. I think there is some talk about happening at, the, at that table about how it is that you bring this, this socially conscientious piece um, into the engineering education. And, you know, the comment earlier about knowledge being bricks, I think knowledge is weightless. So I'd like to use the weightless term instead of the bricks term. Um, but it's, it's that whole thing about, um, someone said to me earlier today, and I tweeted it if anyone's following my tweets, and it was, uh, what is my personal responsibility in building a global culture? And maybe part of that personal responsibility is seeking out the ways in which to become more socially conscious outside of the confines of university education. And, and so um, I thought that was kind of a profound thing. And, and something that you had said earlier that I also wrote down, that's one of on the next Twitter feed, was, uh, you know, do not switch out of, I, I didn't switch out of engineering. I brought my engineering with me as I transitioned through my career. And I and I, I think that's it too, right? Like, you know, as, as an engineering profession, as teaching engineering, you, you you pack in as much as you can in those four years, but what they're really giving you is a means tools by which to Yeah, I like to think of your engineering To thank again each of the speakers. Um, I think we had some really interesting sharing and learning. I know I was jotting down things like crazy and I had a lot for each of you. So let's give a hand to each of you.